Hello, everybody. Welcome to another invitation, another installment of a Rebel Without Applause coming to you, as I always do from this, my little nutshell of infinite space right here in the wood of the holly. And today I have a most incredible and, ex and esteemed guest. My heart is in a little bit of a pitter-patter mode. I'm so excited. This gentleman is currently a professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania. He was a former Supreme Court clerk for Justice David Souter. He is a historian, a constitutional scholar, and I have to say after reading his latest book, a damn good novelist. He also bears one of the most distinguished ancestries imaginable. He is the great, great grandson. I think I got the number of greats correct. He is the great great grandson of that rough riding, trust busting, big stick wielding, square dealer, Teddy, and also more distantly related to the new dealer who saved capitalism, Franklin Delano. I am so pleased and extremely honored to have him with me today on a Rebel Without Applause. Welcome, Kermit Roosevelt IV. How are you? Thanks so much. I'm good. I'm good. I'm really happy to be here. Oh, good. Now, am I right about four? Well, sort of. So I'm I'm the fourth Kermit, but if you look for things that I've written, it will say Kermit Roosevelt the third. There's sort of a complicated story behind that. Um, you know what happened was it for a while people updated and they changed the numeral when a Kermit died. Uh, but then I was the third when I was born. There's only two of us now, so I could be Kermit Roosevelt Jr. if I kept doing that, but it would be very confusing because I've been trying to establish my own identity. Um, and I, I did that in part by being Kermit Roosevelt III when I published things. So if I changed it now, I think it would confuse people. Okay, so there's like a genealogical and numerical sort of truth. And then there's the, the legend truth about you creating your own identity. So we'll settle with that one. And that's three, is that correct? Yes. Good. So let's just for the, because everybody I talk to, or, you know, or about I'm talking to a Roosevelt. I'm so excited. I know they're very interested in at least kind of solidifying the genealogy and then we'll get into the deeper and more important stuff. Firstly, of course, you are the, how many greats is that? Two greats from Teddy. Yeah. So, and by the way, the name Kermit originates with Teddy's wife's family. Is that correct? Yes. The Caros. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so it's, so it's sort of complicated. It's not exactly clear where it comes from, but they had a friend I believe um, the ship's captain named Robert Kermit. Uh -huh. And they took his name, used it as the first name for a cousin, a young cousin of Edith who died very young. Um, and then she took that name to honor her, her cousin um, and used it for Theodore's second son. Okay. And that's pretty much where it comes from as a name in America, I think. So if there's you know, any Kermit out there, we can right. claim some responsibility for that, like Kermit the frog. the frog. I often say that comes from my family, right? I'm not named after the frog. Really, he's named after me. And I see a resemblance as I look at you now. Wait, wait me? Yeah, I do. A I physical see, resemblance? I see the okay. resemblance. I couldn't, you know, I, I mean, I see a little of the TR here behind me. Um, so we've got Teddy and Edith, his second wife, uh, and then a whole slew of children. Your direct ancestor is Kermit, and there was Archie and Quentin, sadly, and uh, just Alice before them. It's a whole big brood. You, I don't know if you guys have family reunions, but your Kermit one uh, famously accompanied TR on that most incredible journey into South America, where he, he nearly lost his life uh, on mm -hmm. the River of Doubt, now Rio Roosevelt. And that was, and then that was followed, and you just correct me, by his son, who also figured prominently in the 20th century as a member of the CIA. And I, I might add about the original Kermit, I'm reading his great book about Mesopotamia. Uh, he, he famously uh, volunteered for the British uh, during the early years of World War I, was dispatched to Mesopotamia, which is Iraq. And mm -hmm. it's a sort of distant echo of American, uh, uh, the American story there in Mesopotamia and Iraq. And then he sadly died during World War II, did uh, Dr. Kermit. And as you mentioned, he had his own struggles with his own identity, I guess, with uh, his, with TR. What do you know about that? 
Well, so Kermit, the first Kermit, I think is a really interesting person. He's sort of a romantic, tragic figure. Um, you know, from an early age, he had sort of depression. You know, he was he was a blonde kid and they they called him the child with the light hair and the dark heart. Um, mm. He was sensitive. He loved poetry. He was good at languages. He was a little bit reckless. He was very adventurous. Um, and basically, I think what happened to him was it was hard for him, I think, to have his own identity with such a larger than life father, but then also having Theodore as his father sort of kept him stable. And when Theodore died, that was when his life kind of went off the rails. Um, and he struggled with alcoholism, depression, and ended up killing himself um, right. during the Second World War, I think, because he felt like there was nothing he could do. So, you know, he, he served in World War I, had some heroics, um, enlisted again for World War II, but now, you know, he's the president's son and they don't want him running off and getting killed. They station him in Alaska where okay. there's really nothing for him to do. And he drinks a lot and, and feels depressed because he's not being useful um, and ended up killing himself. Now, of course, he had a brother, Archibald, who got a Congressional Medal of Honor in World War II and also served in World War I and died, uh, I guess, shortly after the invasion of Normandy. I don't know if there was a rivalry there or that accelerated what had had to do with Kermit. I mean, I, mean, I can only guess. I don't know. Well, I mean, it's, it's complicated and, and hard to recover. There are a lot of books about it. Mm -hmm. um, and you didn't write them. <laughs> no, I didn't write those books. Yeah. And then no, we have I haven't even read most of them, but I've read some. Uh, okay. Them. Well, it's just it's great story. And you know, one of the things that you know, Teddy Roosevelt to me represents sort of the apex of the progressive moment of the Republican Party. You know, it seems like after his presidency, mm -hmm. it becomes more of a corporate thing and as as it drifts through the 20th century, grabs the south and all the stuff kind of know that. Uh, story, but there's also another legacy, and that's imperialism and militarism, which you know he paid a, a hard price for with you know his own son. I don't know what your thoughts are about that. Well, you know, so Theodore Roosevelt is, I think, an inspirational figure in mm -hmm. a lot of ways and ahead of his time. And if you measure him by the standards of his time, he looks good on most things. If you measure him by current standards, he doesn't look so good in some ways. Right. The militarism and the imperialism, I think, are, are one of the problematic aspects. And it is poignant, you know, as I think you were saying, the immense personal cost that he suffered for his embrace of militarism, because he thought military service was great and glorious. And he looked back always very fondly on his service with the Rough Riders in the Spanish-American War and thought it was great when his sons enlisted, um, you know, and then his son Quentin died in yeah. the First World War. And I think that really kind of broke him. He was never the same after that. So, you know, he certainly learned a different perspective on it. Yeah, and I think his sons must have struggled with that, uh, Archie and, and your, now, and Kermit. And now Kermit's son, just want to do the basic, he was, became, well, he was famously, I guess what you would call by Lawrence of Arabia standards, kind of an Arabist. He made a deep study of the Middle East and then was in the OSS, the precursor to the CIA. And I read about him in this great book, maybe it's fully accurate or not, I'm not sure, called All the Shah's Men many years ago, where he was involved with this effort to remove Mossadegh and reinstall the Shah, which sort of right. pointed us on a course into the present moments in our relationship with Persia or Iran and this. That would be your grandfather, am I correct? That's my grandfather, yeah. Did you yeah. know him? Um, I did. I did. He was not um, fully himself in his later years. Mm -hmm. You know, he he had, I guess, heart surgery where there's a problem with the anesthesia. He suffered brain damage. Um, so he wasn't fully there most of the time that I knew him, but I, I did know him. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, like that, too, is kind of a complicated story. Exactly what happens with the Shah and Mossadegh, because, you know, it's it's not that we're overthrowing a democratic government, which is the way that a lot of people look at it now. Right. We were supporting the existing government under the Iranian constitution. Um, you know, Mossadegh was leading a coup. My grandfather's book about this is called Counter Coup. We support the Shah. You know, we give the Shah the will to resist Mossadegh and the Shah dismisses him, which is actually something he's allowed to do under the Iranian constitution. Um, and then, of course, it all goes horribly wrong um, because the Shah turns out to be a cruel dictator and that is what leads 
in a totally unexpected way, of course, but it's what leads to the Islamic revolution. Right. You know, I often felt that what seemed like a success at that moment for Americans' ability to manipulate governments and, and sort of uh, steer events had a blowback later in other places like Central America and later in Vietnam, where we had this sort of outside confidence in our ability to uh, manipulate and shape shape events. And maybe some of that confidence was drawn not only from World War II, but those events shortly after. I don't know. That was just my thinking when I read yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I think so. And then, you know, like, honestly, when I was thinking about, I was at one point thinking about writing a book about my family, which I may still do, but it was, it was sort of about the ways that the generations relate to each other. Um, and you can see kind of a pattern, I think, where like each generation is like, what did my father do wrong? I'm going to fix this. And then it always actually blows up in their face. So for TR, this is like military service because TR loved and revered his father, but felt very bad about the fact that his father didn't serve in the Civil War. Right. Because his father's wife was like, you know, I've got relatives on the South. I can't stand the idea of you fighting them. So TR's father doesn't serve in the Civil War. He actually hires a substitute. And TR is like, I'm going to do the right thing here and serve in the military. And he does. And it's great for him. You know, he charges up San Juan Hill. It's a formative moment. And it seems like he's redeemed his father's failure. But then his sons die. So it sort of comes back and blows up in his face. Right. Um, and then I feel kind of the same way about my grandfather, actually, because what's going on there is like his father, the first Kermit, commits suicide. And it's like, I'm not doing what I need to be doing in this world. I'm out. I can't take it. He can't see the way forward. And I kind of feel like there's something psychological going on there with my grandfather and the Shah who's also this sort of urbane, sophisticated, poetry-loving guy, who's like, this is too tough for me. I can't fight anymore. I'm leaving. And my grandfather's like, no, stay and fight. You have the authority. You're the real ruler. The people love you. They will back you. Interesting. And he does it. And it sort of redeems, this is my theory, like his father's suicide, because he persuades this guy to stay and not give up. And then, Pulevi. of course- the that blows up problem. in his face. Yeah, that blows up in his face because you get the Islamic Revolution. And it turns out it was a terrible mistake. And he was a around when the Islamic Revolution occurred. He could react to that in his own lifetime. He was. Yeah, I mean, he was he was somewhat diminished at that point already. But yeah, so like the U.S. government comes to him and they're like, wow, help us out. You know, can you fix this? It seems like things have gone terribly wrong in Iran and you're our Iran guy. And he was like, no, I absolutely cannot fix this. What, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, my family also has a connection to the Ira Iranian story. My family are broadcasters, radio, radio stations. And my grandfather, I live in somewhat his shadow. He was president of Warner Brothers back in the day. Um, but one of the radio stations we have here in Los Angeles is the only uh, Farsi station, as, I, as far as I know it, in America, K-I-R-N, K-Iran. We own it. We operate it. And um, so I always feel a, a connection to that country. I think our relationship with it is um, you know, terribly misguided. You know, what can I say? Um, I think there's um, some possibilities there that have yet to be really explored, but that's another story for another podcast. What can I say? But your family famously. And then that brings us to your father who you can fill me in just briefly. I believe he was an attorney in Washington, DC. Is that correct? Yeah. And he did not overthrow any governments or uh, was? No, he did not. He did not. He um, focused more on his family, and... I think. You know, so like another thing about Kermit and, and my grandfather, I would say, although, you know, my father could speak to that more. Um, they weren't necessarily great parents, um, you know, and my father was a great father. So you, so you got the beneficiary. You're the beneficiary of that then, of the a little bit of uh, obscurity, you know, not quite in the limelight as some of those other Kermits were, I hope. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's not easy for a child to have a really famous parent who's out there on the world stage. I think you see that definitely in my family history. Well, you said something in one of your books, I think it was uh, that, you know, we don't pick our ancestors, but we pick the people that we identify with. Um, I'm um, uh, quoting loosely. I think that's from 
I think that's the new book, right? That's from the nation that never was. Yeah. Right. But I feel like it's a, it's a theme that works on your fine novel allegiance, which I finished last night, which I have to say, I really liked and took me into a world that I had not have no firsthand knowledge of, which is the marbled halls of the uh, Washington and the Supreme Court and just the bureaucratic intrigue of Washington and World War II. Uh, but that line that, you know, I took from one book definitely offers some insight into the novel. What are your thoughts? Well, I think that America has a complicated relationship to the past. Um, but, you know, for most of us, if your family has been here for a long time, you've got ancestors who did good things and you've got ancestors who did bad things. And you've probably got ancestors on both sides of lots of different issues. Um, right. You know, for me, do I have ancestors? I have relatives who fought for the South. I have relatives who fought for both sides in the Civil War. I think my direct ancestors might be all on the North. But in any case, you know, you've got this complicated history. And as Americans, for some reason, we think that history is very important. We take our guidance from history. And what I was trying to say there was, it's okay to acknowledge that your ancestors did bad things. That doesn't make you a bad person and you shouldn't feel responsible for things that your ancestors did. Um, what you should do is look at our past and figure out who the people are that you wanna honor and who the people are that you wanna identify with. And those don't have to be your ancestors, right? But those are your inspirations. Which cuts right to the theme of your new book that's coming out, I guess, when? And this month or next month? Um, yesterday, I think, like The Nation yesterday. That Never Was. Okay, I mean, The yeah. Nation That Never Was. I don't have a copy of the cover, which I would show to the world um, because it wasn't in the PDF or if it was, I didn't see it. Here it is. The Nation That this Never Was, Reconstructing America's Story by Kermit Roosevelt III. And I recommend it wholeheartedly. I have read it cover to cover and it feels incredibly relevant considering the recent Supreme Court decisions that were, uh, I don't wanna say handed down. I, they kind of felt like they were latrined down onto us yesterday. But you know, when I read that book, there's something very subversive and frigging radical about it that it really sort of lays out in front of us in very compelling and truthful terms. And for me personally, it was very affirming of um, just sort of where I come to in my own research. I remember like last year for Passover, we were talking about freedom. And I said, well, I'm, I don't wanna read the prayers. I'm gonna pass around 13, 14 and 15 the amendments, the reconstruction amendments. Yeah. Everyone looking, what the hell is this? Get back to the old story, you know, about Moses and the, and the Pharaoh and the desert. I said, no, we really want to talk about freedom and really what it means today. Let's look at this stuff right here. Well, I was basically shouted down <laughs> and told <laughs> to shut up, you know, but I stand by my reasoning. And the reason I say that is because that's really at the core of this new book that you wrote and you know to the extent that you want to expand upon it I, I'm, I'm all ears uh, tell me to shut up Bill you know. yeah no I'm not gonna tell you shut up but I, I'd be happy <laughs> to expand on it so the, the basic idea is and you know this is something that I have come to believe very strongly after thinking about it for over 10 years the basic idea is that we're telling ourselves a false story about who we are as a nation and where our values come from. And there are a couple of different reasons why we tell the story the way we do. I think ultimately they're not good reasons. Um, and ultimately there's a better story. So the basic story that we tell ourselves is American values, American identities, fundamentally there in 1776 with the Declaration of Independence. And that states our fundamental values, most famously in the phrase, all men are created equal. And we're not living up to those values at the founding because slavery exists and we sort of move towards them in fits and starts, but we're always kind of guided by the Declaration of Independence and we're trying to make its ideals a reality. Right. And if you tell American history this way, it's a story of continuity because the values are there and they're sort of progressively developed. Um, it's a story of success 
because we triumph over the obstacles in our path. And it's a story of looking back. So the way to move forward is always to look back, you know, recover the greatness of the past. And this is a false story, I think, because it's not the case, actually, that the Declaration of Independence announces values that aren't fully realized in founding America. It doesn't announce those values. No. All men are created equal in 1776 means something very, very different. All from white what you men think would, it means all white today. men with property are created equal, I think. Yeah, yeah, sort of. I mean, technically, all men are created equal refers to all men, but it's John Locke, Second Treatise of Government, Enlightenment Social Contract Theory. It has nothing to do with how society should be organized, and it has nothing to do with how society should treat people who are outsiders. That's sort of the key point. My so the Declaration also, of Independence does say like government should protect the natural rights of the people who form them. But uh -huh. it doesn't say governments shouldn't enslave people who are outsiders to that government, right? That's okay, according to the political philosophy of the Declaration. Maybe it means, and I think you alluded to this, I don't know if you're in your book, but elsewhere, that when he said, when they said all men are created equal, what they meant to say is, yeah, King George, you, you don't have divine right. That was exactly the real the real meaning of it but of course words take on their own meaning in their own time and and right. so as you say frederick right. douglas yeah so meanings change right and people who are arguing for this notion that the government should treat people equally how do you make that argument in america in the 1820s like what document talks about equality not the constitution right the constitution is actually pretty pro slavery there's right. not a lot you can do with it. So the Declaration of Independence, hey, it's got the word equal. It's got the word liberty. So yeah. those are promising words. And people put this meaning into it. Because again, as Americans, we always like to argue based on the authority of the past. So people who are opposing slavery basically start reading the Declaration this way. And the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln does, and Lincoln does in the Civil War. And then we carry this idea forward so that when we do what's really a revolution, what's really the destruction of the first republic of founding America, we do this, we, right, we destroy it with the Civil War and Reconstruction, and we remake the Constitution with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, but we still say what we're doing is really developing this founding ideal, when in fact we're not. Right? In fact, we're making something new. Right. And people don't say that. Um, which is unfortunate because if you're telling the standard story, you're like, hey, America is born with the Declaration of Independence, even though the Declaration of Independence complains about slave rebellions. And the heroes of our nation are the revolutionaries, even though it was the British who were freeing slaves during the revolution. And the revolutionaries were like, this is terrible. We want those people back, right? When we win the war in the Treaty of Paris, we're like, give us back our slaves. Right. That's what Wasn't the revolutionaries it, Didn't said. the British issue their own emancipation proclamations during yeah. the Civil War? That, yeah, during the Revolutionary War, the British I mean, freed the, slaves. the Revolutionary War, I yeah. meant. And, yeah. uh, and if you were sitting on a plantation somewhere and you were literate, you might you would could easily come to the conclusion that your chances for manumission or emancipation were far better with the British than these friggin colonies. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you look at where which side blacks fought on in, in the Revolutionary War, four to one, they're with the British. So it's a very problematic story. If you're like, these are our heroes, these are our values. You know, slavery is right there centrally contradicting most of them. But if you want to say America starts with this nice statement of values, you can do that. But it's the Gettysburg Address. It's not the Declaration of Independence. If you want to say America starts with a war for liberty, you can do that. But it's the Civil War. It's not the revolution. If you want to say we wrote those principles into law in our Constitution, you can do that. But it's the Reconstruction Constitution, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. As you said, right. it's not the original Constitution. So basically, the point is drop the founding. Forget the founding. That's not our America. That's not actually a very good America. Reconstruction. That's us. That's where our values come from. Well, and also, I just want to add to think certain forward thinking people, not, I guess, like Frederick Douglass in his July 4th speech, he uses these, they're very powerful rhetorical tools that all men are created equal. And Lincoln uses it. Martin Luther King uses it. So it has a rhetorical kick-ass frigging 
power, but the truth of it really lies somewhere else. It's basically your the case yeah. you're taking. And yeah, and so like, why do people use it? It does have rhetorical power, I guess. But I mean, think about it. So you're Martin Luther King. It's 1963. Mm -hmm. And you're like, states are denying people the right to vote based on race. That is inconsistent with something. What is it inconsistent with? Is it inconsistent with all men are created equal? Well, no, because, you know, all men are created equal, 1776. Every one of those 13 states allows slavery. Right. To say nothing about race-based denial of the right to vote. Um, what is race-based denial of the right to vote inconsistent with? The 15th Amendment, which says exactly that, right? right? Couldn't be clearer. So Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, I'm saying, appeal to the Declaration of Independence because they have nothing else. Martin Luther King, why is he talking about the Declaration of Independence when he's got the 15th Amendment? It's because Reconstruction is divisive. And you can see this very clearly with Martin Luther King, because if you go back to the early king, the high school king, Right. before he's realized some sad truths about what white America is willing to stand up for. When he's addressing the question of how black Americans deserve to be treated, which he does in this high school oratory contest, writes a speech called The Negro and the Constitution. It's all about reconstruction. It's all about the Civil War. 1963, you get to I Have a Dream. It's all gone. He's talking about the founding. He doesn't mention the Civil War. He doesn't mention the Reconstruction Amendments. And why is that? basically because he's trying to bring white Americans together in the service of this vision that everyone can be comfortable with. And he thinks the founding is how you do that. But as we know, it doesn't work out. Right. And I just wanted to add, you know, you talk about in your book, um, Dred Scott decision, Justice Taney, and I'm reading this and I'm going, is he defending this decision? And then what I came to realize, I believe, and just bust me in the mouth if I'm wrong, is that this justice and that court were really consistent with the Constitution when they made that decision. They were not, the Constitution embraced slavery and the property rights of their slave owners across national boundaries. So while it's it inflamed uh, the abolitionists and maybe accelerated the moment for Lincoln, in fact, I guess as a legal scholar, it was pretty consistent with the founding documents. Am I saying that right? Yeah, you're saying that right. So, I mean, people disagree about this, but it's very hard to have a sort of objective evaluation of Dred Scott because everyone agrees Dred Scott is an evil and racist decision, right? And I agree with that too. But if you're telling this story where we're the same America we've always been and Dred Scott was right, then you're saying that was an evil and racist constitution and we're the same nation. We are still evil and racist, right? It seems like a terrible thing. It seems like an indictment of America to say Dred Scott was right. But what I'm saying is we're a different nation. Right. What you say about founding America has no consequences for America today because we destroyed founding America. Right. And I just we fought a war one. against them and we won. And the secessionists used the founding document uh, the declaration as this for the same rationale for secession when in the course of human events there's such assholes that they're right. taking away all our liberties right. we're justified in, in revolt and rebellion that right. is and i think they're clearly right about that right because what are they doing they're declaring independence right they're saying we set up this government it was supposed to do certain things we think that the government has turned against us which it kind of had right abraham lincoln is an opponent of slavery um and we think that a different government would better serve our interests. That's what the declaration says you can do. Right. The Confederacy celebrated July 4th. Right. There were newspaper editorials saying, we are the loyal inheritors of the great principles of Independence Day, right? right. Celebrate July 4th in right. Charleston, South Carolina. So rebellion is not revolution. The heirs of rebellion is uh, you know, the Confederacy and Lincoln in his own way is the first big revolutionary. I think I'm paraphrasing you, but. Yeah, so I say that too. Um, Lincoln is a revolutionary in a sort of different sense. So the American revolutionaries, they're secessionists. They're like, right. we're taking our stuff and we're going. Right. And the Southern secessionists are also secessionists. We're taking our stuff, we're going. And all of that is based on like Declaration of Independence, consent of the governed, we're gonna make the government to govern us that mm -hmm. we think is right. And Lincoln is doing something different because Lincoln is saying, I'm going to 
overthrow your government, right? I'm going to rule you despite your lack of consent, which is inconsistent with the de Declaration of Independence, and I'm going to make your society into a more just one. So in the Gettysburg Address, he's like, we will have a new birth of freedom. Right. Government of the people, by the people, for the people. Democracy. Declaration of Independence is not about democracy. But the Gettysburg Address is, and the Reconstruction Amendments are. So this is a revolution of a different kind, right? It's not a secessionist revolution. It's a, we're going to change our fundamentally unjust society into a just one. Now, one of the, you know, I wrote a script called The Children, which is my adaptation of David Halberstam's book about uh, these young people that were um, mentored by James Lawson and the discipline of Gandhi and how they use those tools first at the lunch counters and then later at the freedom rides. And I got so consumed that the real path to progress is a Gandhian path, meaning nonviolence. And then when I revisited, when I read your book and I've read others and I've spoken to people, people you know, like Manisha uh, Sinha, and there doesn't seem to be a way to have achieved that revolution in 1865 and the reconstruction years without violence. As a matter of fact, there's probably no way under normal times that the 13th and 14th and 15th could have ever been, um, those amendments could have ever been included in the, in the constitution. But for the fact, you know, the South was defeated in war and also there were union occupying armies in those states and those legislatures were disbanded to create those documents, to, to create those amendments or to fulfill that revolution that you're talking about. So mm -hmm. that just came, crashing into this idea that I'd been thinking about so much about nonviolence and that's the way forward. Yeah, so I mean, nonviolent change, I don't know, right? What would have happened without the Civil War? Could you have had nonviolent anti-slavery movements that would have prevailed in the South? Maybe, I don't know. Um, I mean, what we can say about ordinary politics is, you couldn't have amended the constitution to abolish slavery without the civil war because you need three quarters of the states you're never going to get that get yeah um and in fact you couldn't have gotten the 14th amendment so after the civil war the southern states realized they've lost they realized slavery is ending at least formally mm -hmm. and the defeated confederate states reconstructed under president johnson and they're still basically the same states because you've got former confederates in these right. state legislatures. They accept the 13th Amendment, but they reject the 14th Amendment. This is something that I think not a lot of people know. The 14th Amendment is drafted by Congress. It's sent out to the states for ratification and they reject it. And it's clear you're not gonna get three quarters of the states ratifying it. And it's in response to that, that Congress enacts the Reconstruction Acts and wipes out those states. And then it remakes them. It remakes the former Confederate states. They have the same names. They have the same borders, but they have a different political body. They have different citizens because now the freed blacks are citizens mm -hmm. and the former Confederates aren't allowed to vote. They're not allowed to participate in the drafting of the new conventions. So you've got new states and those are the states that ratify the 14th Amendment. It's not the founding state of Virginia. It's not the founding state of South Carolina. It's a new state. And that's the legacy that we're living with and still fighting over today. And of course, there's the promise of reconstruction and then the tragedy of it as the Union armies withdraw and the rise of the Klan and a hundred years more of subjugation and servitude. And tenant farming is basically an updated form of uh, serfdom, you know, of, of some mm -hmm. sort. So it's an ongoing struggle. Now we had these decisions that were just handed down to us last week, one about guns and two finally the Roe v. Wade uh, thing. And, um, you know, after reading your book, I thought, well, are they just reading the, the founding documents? That's what they're inspired by. It doesn't seem like 13, 14 and 15 or 14 and 15 are really part of that decision. I don't know what your thoughts are, but, you know, it's right in our face right now. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I do think that the Supreme Court's approach to the Constitution suffers a whole lot from paying too much attention to 1787 and not enough to 1868. 
Um, I also think that, you know, even if you're talking about 1868, we're not as aware as we should be of the dark side of part of that history. So if you're looking at the traditions of 1868, it's kind of a good moment for equality in terms of racial equality, but sex equality, no, it's not. So when the Supreme Court is like, well, we're gonna to try to figure out whether the 14th amendment protects a right to abortion by looking at how people thought in 1868, you're looking at a world of incredible sex discrimination. Um, and why should we consider that to be okay? Why should we think that those are the attitudes we should be channeling in order to figure out the fundamental rights that women have today? Now, I have a question for you. My best friend is an assistant U.S. attorney here downtown, and we kicked this around the other day. And I said to him, well, doesn't the Equal Protection Clause, like a woman's reproductive uh, rights, she has more reproductive rights in California than she does in Texas right now. Isn't, doesn't that run right up against the Equal Protection Clause in the 14th Amendment? And he said, no. And I said, what? What are your thoughts on that? Well, so disuniformity in terms of state law, I think, does not raise equal protection concerns. That's just an aspect of, of our federalism. I do think that there's an equal protection argument for abortion, right, which is, I think, the stronger argument. Um, which is, you could say as a judge, and this is sort of what the Supreme Court was saying, life and liberty are both important values and we're gonna let the legislature decide which is more important because usually we like legislative value choices rather than judicial ones, mm -hmm. but it's not okay. And this is what you should say. It's not okay for the legislature to value women's liberty less than men's. So why don't we take a look at the way life liberty trade-offs are usually handled? in America? And the answer is liberty almost always wins. So what do we make the general public do to save other people's lives? Or what do we make men in particular do to save other people's lives? Do we have mandatory blood donation? Do we have mandatory organ donation or mandatory post-mortem organ donation or even opt out rather than opt in post-mortem organ donation? The answer is none of those things, right? We don't care about life if it's any kind of infringement on people's liberty. And yet with abortion, we're demanding that women in the name of potential life suffer this incredible infringement on their bodily autonomy and bear this incredible burden that's completely unlike anything else our society does to people. Um, highly suspect, I would say. Uh, you know, And the Dobbs opinion doesn't really engage with that. They just say, oh, we decided that abortion restrictions aren't sex discrimination. But maybe those are the cases they should be reconsidering rather than Roe. That was my take on that. And how does it make you feel? Well, it makes me feel that our constitution is badly designed because why do we have this situation? We have this because of the electoral college and we have it because of the way that Supreme Court justices are appointed. So the Republican presidential candidate has won once in the past 34 years in terms of the popular vote. Correct. Um, does it make sense that that leads to a 6-3 Republican majority on the Supreme Court? I think no. I think that doesn't make any sense at all. And the Electoral College is part of the problem. But the fact that the composition of the Supreme Court is determined by sort of random chance, strategic retirements, and partisan hardball is another part of the problem. And if we had 18-year term limits, which I'm in favor of and I've been working on for a while, we wouldn't have that problem. You know, we would get a Supreme Court where the composition is responsive to the outcome of presidential elections in a predictable and regular way. And that would be an improvement. Now, your uh, Franklin Delano, your distant uh, uncle, fifth, I don't know how many removed, you, you know, wanted to pack the court in order to make, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, realize his new deal. Does that feel like an option? Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I... Not 100% sure I would say that he was right, but I'm pretty sure it's right now. The reason that he had to do that was, again, the lack of term limits. So, you know, Roosevelt is winning the presidency by landslides and the Democrats control Congress, but he's not getting judicial appointments. And so these justices who represent a minority are blocking his legislative agendas um, in the name of this view of the Constitution that the nation has rejected. And his response is maybe we need more justices then. Um, and that's what happens, right? If you don't have regular turnover that allows popular majorities to influence 
the composition of the court, then you get conflict between the elected branches and the court. And eventually the way that the elected branches get their way is through court packing. And, you know, that's the system that our constitution sets up. It's got these bad features that produces these conflicts, but it also does not say that there should be nine Supreme Court justices. It leaves that up to Congress. So that's a power that the elected branches have. So going back to the founders constitution, it's like we have these evolutionary vestiges like whales, ancient whales had little feet that they weren't using and we're living with those. One of those to me, of course, is the electoral college. Um, and um, just also just the, the fact that there's two senators for each state. So you know, there's 15 people in Wyoming and there's 50 million in California, like what? And then you layer on top of that, the filibustering uh, rule, which is not, I don't believe it's enshrined in any law. And then the filibustering rule now, it's like the old Mr. Smith goes to Washington filibuster where, okay, Mr. Senator, you disagree. I get it. Exercise your rights. Get on the fucking floor and talk about it until your throat drops out, until you're exhausted. Get on, you know, make your case. Go do it. You're a senator. That's also gone. There's no exposure for it today. So it's like, it's just like this layered anti-democratic thing that we have that's just a cork for any kind of social progress. That's the way I look at it. Maybe you're in alignment with that. It sounds like you are, but. Oh yeah, no, I, I totally am. So one thing that you said which is completely accurate is that the electoral college is vestigial because it was created to solve or respond to a bunch of concerns that are not concerns anymore, right? One of which is slavery, right? right. How do you account for the enslaved populations of particular states? in terms of how much influence they have over presidential elections. The Electoral College is designed to sort of incorporate the three-fifths compromise and give states that enslave people extra power in the federal government, right? So obviously that's bad. Right. Um, it's also designed to respond to the problem of low information voters. So we do have low information voters now, but it's not the case that people don't know who's running for president. Mm -hmm. So the concern there was, you know, you've got like the New England candidate and in the South, no one knows who he is. So they don't know whether they should vote for him or not, right? That's not a problem. And then the third issue was if you do direct popular votes and you let people vote based on state qualifications, which is the way that we do it for the House of Representatives, then states have a pressure to expand their franchise, right? So Virginia wants a Virginian president. They want lots of votes coming from Virginia. If you're doing a direct popular election, they might be like, hey, let women vote. Right. And then suddenly you've got twice as many Virginians voting. And the drafters of the Constitution didn't want the states to face that pressure, to face this pressure of expanding their franchise. So they did the Electoral College. So basically three reasons. All of them are bad. There's no reason we should have that today. And then also the anti-democratic Senate. That's terrible. It's right. terrible. Um, you know, you've got senators who represent a minority of the population controlling the Senate. And they're That's the ones not new. who. That's yeah, not no, new. it's not new. It's, it's gotten much worse than it used to be, though. And, you know, you see this so vividly with the Supreme Court today because Trump, who loses the popular vote, somehow gets three appointments, right? Obama in eight years gets two. Trump in four years gets three, despite losing the popular vote. Those justices are confirmed by senators who represent a minority of the American population. Um, and now they're the ones who are driving constitutional law. <laughs> um, my, oh, my environmentally friendly light went off. Oh, okay. I've got like a motion sensor light. Oh, yeah, when no, I'm okay. Trying to... okay, so you're on all the right, right well, side of all the. You're like TR with the conservation. Very good. Yes, TR also had motion sensing lights that would go yeah. off unpredictably. Yeah, and national parks, thank God. Yeah. Um, so the Electoral College. Yeah, I mean, I, what was my joke? I said, uh, it's a Trump University, you know, and the Electoral College. I don't know, there's some joke there. I forgot what I said. Uh, the PVP, Putin's vice president. Yeah, right. we're living in that that the terrible le legacy of the Electoral College. And you said something in the book, too, that was struck me as interesting. It was a little counterintuitive, but made sense when I thought about it, was that the three-fifth compromise was, in fact, had it been two-fifths or one-fifths, that would have favored the North. Yeah. But and had it been five fifths, it would have meant that the southern slave power could have accounted for all of their enslaved people, uh, 
to build up their represent representation in in the various legislatures and in the, and then in the House of Representatives. I hadn't really thought of it that way, but it, it makes sense. And then in a way it becomes even more devious after the Civil War when the three-fifths clause mm -hmm. is abolished. So guess what? A black person is now five-fifths of a person, but guess what? He ain't voting. We ain't letting him get to the ballot box. So in a way it's like, and just correct me because I'm just thinking, you know, like Bill, it's worse on that level. Yeah, well, three fifths, it's five fifths, but they can't vote. And they couldn't mm -hmm. vote before and they can't vote after, but we get more counting, we can account more for them. Right, so I, the three fifths compromise is sort of, it's a little bit more complicated than, than some people think um, in that the anti-slavery position is zero, right? Not five fifths, but zero. Um, because the zero, question, correct. yeah, right, count enslaved people as zero for the purposes of determining representation. Because the whole point there is the states are not representing people they enslave, right? You send the South Carolina representatives to Congress, do they vote to advance the interests of enslaved people? No, of course they don't, no. right? So you don't get more representatives for people that you don't represent, should be the rule, um, which would set it at zero. Now, it's sort of complicated because some people, read it as inflicting a kind of dignitary harm where you're saying that an enslaved person is only three fifths of a human. Right. And for a long time, I was like, no, no, really, that's not what it's about at all, because it is about political power. And from the perspective of political power, it would be better from an anti-slavery perspective to say, set it at zero rather than three fifths. James Madison in the Federalist Papers actually says exactly that, though. He says three fifths is right because slavery deprives people of three fifths of their personhood and converts two fifths of them into property. So right, there's your founding fathers again. Um, but then the other thing that you were saying is true also, right after the 13th amendment, when slavery is abolished, now the three fifths compromise is superseded and the Southern states are going to be getting more representatives for people whom they can't enslave anymore, but whom they do deny the right to vote. But the 14th amendment responds to that. The 14th amendment says, we're going to zero for people that you don't let vote. We're going to zero for people that you don't let vote if they're over 21 and male. So this is where I was saying before 1868 is not so great for sex discrimination. The 14th amendment actually is kind of explicitly endorses sex discrimination with respect to voting. Now, the 14th amendment is a big friggin' amendment and it seems to be reinterpreted. It's a big blanket and it's been expanded and reinterpreted many times mostly to expand liberty. I got a question for you about section C or section three about the 14th amendment in view of these uh, January 6th hearings. And um, it basically prohibits uh, somebody who held federal office as I understand it and participates in a rebellion or sedition against the United States is forbidden from holding offices in the future, which was originally designed to keep those mm -hmm. senators and congressmen who defected to the Confederacy from getting back into the government, uh, from president to postal uh, postmaster, I think it applies. Mm -hmm. How come nobody's talking about that in any real way, or I don't read I, occasionally, in relationship to uh, the insurrection in uh, you know, 2020, uh, and specifically with the, you know, the, the billionaire brat board, Putin's vice president, you know, the PVP. Well, how come I'm not hearing that? Well, there's no way he could run because he's running straight into section three of the 14th Amendment. Well, so people, people are talking about that. Um, I mean, I think the thing, the thing with Trump was they were trying to prevent him from holding office by impeaching him. Right. Um, you know, and if, if he'd been convicted, that would have been one of the penalties. Um, there are actually lawsuits going on about this with Madison Cawthorn at least. Um, well, I guess maybe that's mooted now. But people were right. challenging the qualifications of Republican members of Congress on the grounds that they had participated in an insurrection. Um, it's pretty unclear how that provision is supposed to be enforced. Um, you know, if you're dealing with a member of Congress, then Congress could just do it. Congress could refuse to seat someone, which mm -hmm. is how they would have done it with the Civil War. Um, harder to see how you do that with the president. So there are a lot of interesting legal questions, but there are people working on them. Because as I understand it, there's, 
it says that very clearly. You don't even have to be a lawyer to see that. It's very simple. But there's not a mechanism to determine if and when he did it in that amendment, as I recall. Right. There's no mechanism. There's no fact finding mechanism. It doesn't say who decides. It doesn't say how it's enforced. It just sort of sets out this rule. And again, like in the context of the Civil War, it's pretty clear. You know, if you served in the government of the Confederacy or you served in the Confederate Army, then you participated in the insurrection. And if you took an oath to support the Constitution, that's what triggers this. If you took an oath to support the U.S. Constitution, then you violated that oath and now you're barred from office. And mostly they were thinking about members of Congress, where the way that it would be enforced, and this actually happened, was the Southern states would send these people and they would present their credentials and Congress would refuse to seat them. Right. But didn't Andrew Johnson intervene with all kinds of pardons and then they got back into the government anyway? Well, Andrew Johnson did and Congress did. Congress pardoned a whole bunch of these people and they came back like Alexander Stevens, vice president of the Confederacy, comes back into Congress. Right. Now we talk about the founding fathers, Jefferson, Madison. Okay. Who can we identify beyond Lincoln as maybe a fresh group of founding fathers? Uh, Reconstruction Congress, I think. So, I mean, you know, founding fathers, the way we do it now, like we look at people before the revolution. So we're like Sam Adams is great. Mm -hmm. So we can do that. We can be like Frederick Douglass is a founding father, I would say. So, you know, you look at abolitionists before the Civil War, because the story that I'm telling, and I think it's accurate, um, and it's it's in some ways similar to the standard story, is like America is formed by opposition to slavery, right? That's where our America comes from, right? And that's a good America. We like that. That's an America you can be proud of. So I would look at the pre-Civil War abolitionists. I would look at Lincoln. I would look at the Reconstruction Congress. So Thaddeus Stevens, yeah. John Bingham, um, Sumner, Sumner, Charles Sumner. Yeah. So these are great, inspiring figures, you know, and if you're if you're like, wow, the person who articulated our American ideals in this great piece of rhetoric, you could have Abraham Lincoln right in the Gettysburg Address, you know, right. a new birth of freedom, government of the people, by the people, for the people. Hey, that's pretty good as origin stories go, right? Or you could be like Thomas Jefferson, who raped his slaves, enslaved his own children, wrote all men are created equal, which didn't mean at all what we think it means nowadays. Like, how could you not want Lincoln instead of Jefferson? Right. So I was thinking maybe we could go to like uh, Little Missouri River, Medora, North Dakota, find Mm. where T.R., famously went, you know, as a young man after the death of his young bride and the birth of his first daughter and find a big fucking rock, big one, big mountain rock. And we got like four, we can get five faces on there, you know, maybe sitting bull too, you know, a little, some of the, give some native Americans a little, mm-hmm. a little cred. And we want to get four fresh new faces. We'll put it on a, T.R. Elkhorn, somewhere in Elkhorn, where he had that great ranch. And let's get some fresh faces on there. So I'm going to nominate Frederick Douglass, who in my mind is the most important person of the 19th century in terms of his journey and his as an enslaved person. And then now you throw me another name. Um, Charles Sumner. Charles Sumner. Okay. I just read this book by Bruce Levine. He was on my podcast. He did Daddy Stephen. Daddy so, Stephen's great. How get him, John get, Brown. John Brown. Right. Now he's kind of problematic a little bit because of, you know, Harper's Ferry and the violence and stuff like that. But OK, that w- we could debate that. Right. You know, John Brown. OK. We got who do we got? We got maybe we got to throw. Come on. Sojourner Truth. We got to give her some cred, too. Harriet Tubman. Yeah, Harriet Tubman. Let's go Harriet. We'll just go with Harriet. I think she got the, I haven't seen the bill yet, but I I assume it's coming. So we got Frederick, Harriet, we got Abe. I would say Abe, yes. Yeah, Abe Lincoln, of course. Yeah, and then you got, he's the only guy from the other one, from Rushmore. And then we got, and you're, you got TR on the other one too, but we got, we got Sumner, well, Thaddeus Stevens, yeah, we oh, could do John, John Brown. 
John Brown. John Brown. Mm-hmm. Your reaction, Ulysses S. Grant. Yeah. I As think a general Grant's and president. Mm-hmm. Is there anybody else? Maybe that's not such a big name, you know, by, you know, maybe in Congress or a black person who deserves yeah. it. Yeah. Robert Smalls. Hiram Revels. Hiram Revels. Blanche Bruce. Black Blanche Republican Bruce members was, of Congress. Blanche Senator, Bruce was. Senator from Mississippi. Right. Okay. He came after Hiram, right? Yeah. Or Robert Smalls. Right. Who was helping Born me out. into slavery, commandeers a Confederate warship, escapes. Frees his family, joins the Union forces. This rock is getting really big. (laughs) Well, that's the thing. Like, look at look at the Civil War and Reconstruction. There are plenty of great heroes, you know, who make Thomas Jefferson look like the total creep that he is. Right. Right. Now, can you give? I'm going to wrap this up. This is so much fun, Kermit. I feel like I got my new best friend. You're so brilliant and fun, and I love the novel. I want to recommend people reading Allegiance. Uh, I'm always interested, by the way, in the personal dimension of the novel, like how you identified with that main character, Cash. And did you, just as a, I'm, I'm pinballing away, did you grow up in Philadelphia on the main line? Was that the world that you came out of, that this guy came out of? No, no, I did a lot of research into that. I grew up in DC, um, which is actually not that similar. So Philadelphia uh-huh. had a particularly distinct insular club-based scene. Right. That I, I read a lot about that. Because you, you weren't in the Marion Country Club or whatever that. No, club. although I, I went out to the Marion Cricket Club to do research. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, it must be. Yeah. I love the movies, you know, the Philip Berry stuff, you know, it's so great. Oh, yeah. Um, God, I don't even know what I was thinking about. I was, I was just kind of dovetailing back to Allegiance and how the themes that you talk about in the recent book um, about the constitution actually are they they kind of are they're in the in the novel in a, in a way too you know and your relationship the character's relationship to privilege and of course we talk about white privilege as a general sort of idea but then there's another level of privilege, which is the privilege of that the people of the main line enjoy, which is a privilege that includes something that I've come to appreciate from afar. And that's the privilege of access to power in real ways, like real intimate access. And that's something that your character deals with in this novel. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are about that as you wrote it. What what kind of feelings did it bring up in your own life, you know, as you thought about it? Well, it it was sort of personal in a lot of ways. I mean, there are some autobiographical similarities between me and Cash. The big the big emotional one was really supposed to be sort of the the dawning of an awareness of how unfair the world is. Um, you know, and a realization that there are lots of things that have worked to your benefit that aren't fair. Um, And then part of that also is sort of realizing what other people have done for you that you kind of wish they hadn't done. And that Mm -hmm. could be like in the distant past, or it could be in the present. And that, you know, that happens with cash in a couple different ways. For me, like the emotional counterpart to that was Guantanamo. So in the years before I was writing Allegiance, I had worked on some Guantanamo litigation. Right. And basically, like, I went into that at the beginning being like, oh, yeah, you know, the government is trying to protect Americans and it's trying to do the right thing and it's competent and it's good. And, you know, our government is looking out for us the way it should. And then, like, you learn more and more about what they've done and they're incompetent and they're kind of bad mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. And you're like, wow. It's very disturbing to me that like the safety and harmony of American society is built on these terrible things that we do to other people. And like, I wouldn't want you to do that. And the government is like, we're keeping you safe. And the answer that Cash gives in the book is I didn't want to be safe, right? I wanted to be good. What's interesting too, is that he doesn't, he's manipulated. He doesn't, his own, when he goes to the draft board in the beginning and he gets a physical that's manipulated. He isn't even unaware. He, he's expecting, I guess, to be, he's an athlete. It, apparently he's a good tennis player and squash player. 
and yet he's denied and that's manipulated by uh the judge i guess is that correct and i get that right yeah i mean not to give away too many spoilers but <laughs> I don't want to give away spoilers. Um, but, yeah, you know, yes. It's, like, so it's that's, all about right. privilege and some of it you don't even recognize. And you right. mentioned even in the later book, you know, privilege taken away or something about privilege and you're right. You put it in quotes, by the way, and I can't find a fucking quote, but it's, it's just for those that are privileged when it's taken away, it feels like an abuse. I think it's- Equality um, feels like oppression. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I think that's something that feels like oppression. Yes, a lot. Like there's a lot of Americans have a sense of the way the world should be, mm -hmm. which basically involves white Christian men in charge. And something that looks different is very upsetting to them. And it feels like something's being taken from them. And yeah, something is being taken, but it's not something that you were entitled to because right. equality is what we should consider natural, right? I mean, and that's actually like the good thing to take from the Declaration of Independence. When it says all men are created equal, that's kind of what it means. If you didn't have a government, if you didn't have any laws, everyone would be equal. And yeah. that's what we should think of as natural, not like racial, sex-based, religion-based hierarchy. Which brings up affirmative action and the possibility of reparations going forward and the larger thorny question of restorative justice and how very often when you try and put that into play, in the minds of many, it creates new injustices as a kind of corollary to what you just said. So. Those are big questions going forward. I don't have the answer, but I think you do. Well, they're they're big and difficult questions. And I like I have almost mixed feelings about affirmative action because I've I've come to think that a big problem with our society is that people don't realize how unfair and unequal it is. And affirmative action makes it look better than it is, right? Affirmative action makes it look as though, hey, look we've got this great minority representation in our schools and in our corporations and in our law firms, but we wouldn't have that without affirmative action, right? We are not a society where that can happen on its own. We mm -hmm. are not a society where people with talent and drive and determination can make it to the top no matter where they start. We wouldn't need affirmative action if we were that kind of a society. So when you make people think that we are that kind of a society, I think it's harmful in some ways. Um, and then like reparations, I'm kind of in favor of reparations. I'm not necessarily in favor of the idea that will be like, your ancestors did wrong and you must pay and your ancestors were injured, so you get money. Uh -huh. I'm not sure I, I like that as an idea. And I think, you know, that would never fly politically. But if you look at what we've done, like what the federal government in particular did over basically the whole 20th century, it was redistributing money to the white middle class and systematically excluding black Americans from the right. GI bill and the housing support and all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And gosh, I mean, how big a sacrifice would it be to say, now we've got a lot of federal aid and we're gonna try to target it so that it does help minorities rather than excluding them. I mean, that seems like a pretty small thing to do. So ironically, much of the benefits of the new deal was skewed and directed to white people, probably to, yeah. to secure it politically as well. Another example yeah. of, of unity over justice. Yeah, exactly. Uh, your theme keeps uh, coming up and she whiz Kermit, I'm really digging this. You're in Philadelphia somewhere as I speak. I'm here in Hollywood, but there's, um, I'm just really excited to have had this conversation and that you kindly agreed to do it. You know, I've always been a huge, um, I don't know if the word fan is the right word, but you know, your esteemed ancestor and their legacy, including yours now, have just always ranked really just high in my thinking. And I I just was I there's this new TR documentary out there. It's kind of it's, it's two parts. It's really good, you know. And of course, the thing that really hit me is the this, one one of the things that really hit me was that when he's just a little boy and he's there's a photograph and they go, yeah, that's, there's two little figures in there. One of them is Teddy Roosevelt looking down on Lincoln's funeral procession. Yeah. That was in Washington or was that in New York? That's in New York, I think. So, so, so on his way back to Illinois, Illinois, he goes through New York and that's where that's observed. Because mm -hmm. TR is of course a citizen of New York. And I feel like, you're living in the legacy of that moment as well. 
right from your ancestor to this this moment and helping us understand it. So I want to thank yeah. you for that. And and folks, read the novel. The guy's a novelist. He's all over the place. You know, he's he's a. It's just fantastic what you're doing, and I, I hope I get a chance to meet you in real life. We'll take a trip down the Amazon or something. <laughs> yeah, we'll go down the Amazon together. But how about the Squirrel Killer? What, what's that yeah. river there? <laughs> Schuylkill. We call it the Schuylkill. The Schuylkill, or uh, the yeah. one that goes between New Jersey, the Delaware River. We can take I, the River of the Delaware. It's not so doubtful, you know. Right. You go That's shadow. a better choice. Yeah, less mosquitoes. So, anyway. Yeah. She was. Thanks so much. Is there anything that I didn't touch or that you want to touch on about the, the book or the novel and your own life? I'm always trying to skew this thing in a personal direction. Like, who are you and how are you relating to, to your main character, Cash, and the privilege that clearly you have experienced and the capacity to redefine your own life along newer values? You know, that's when the guy goes west to marry the Jewish girl you know, it's like, okay, I'm going to paint my own canvas. And I, I'm curious to just as a closing thought, to what extent that informed your own life and your own thinking about your own possibilities? Um, well, a fair amount, I guess. I mean, a lot of it is sort of drawn from my own experience and my own feelings. Yeah, of course it is. It comes out of you. It has to be, you know, It'd be an interesting movie. I'd be curious to like, how, how would I, well, how would I frame that, you know? Probably start with the, uh, when he goes in for the physical. Mm -hmm. Because that's the big reveal at the end, you know, that it's all manipulated. And, yeah. that, and that his whole, this whole world that he's come to revere is based on crime. You yeah. Know? I think that's the core thing. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm wearing you out here, Kermit. <laughs> no, no, I could do this for hours. You could. Oh. Really, yeah, no, I really enjoy it. You do. Well, thank you so much. You know, if you want to do it again, we can do part two, you know. Um, sure. I, I really enjoy it. It's so fun. And I, I told all my friends, and I can't believe I, the guy called me in 15 minutes later. He wants to do it. I'm so excited. So uh, that's how I feel. And I really enjoyed the scholarship and the works of imagination and, and, and the melding of both. And, uh, you know, I, I thought, lastly, the Tula Reservation, that's up in Northern California near the, the Oregon border, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had not heard of that, but I drive by all the oh, time. Yeah. I just went fly fishing past Manzanar, you know, which as far as I know, is the most famous of those relocation centers where the Japanese were herded. I was mm -hmm. not aware of the place you mentioned. It, it seemed like that was a place for harder core uh, people that were more suspect about their loyalty is that correct yeah that's what they that's what they did later on in the war they they turned it into a relocation center for people who'd been determined to be disloyal although one of the things that happened again and again was they kept trying to decide who was loyal and who was disloyal and they kept being unable to do it and at the core i don't want to give this away because then it's like the murder mystery but the core of the crime that he ultimately comes face to face with has to do with the ripping off of these people and their resources, I believe. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. All right, Kermit, I'm, I'm wearing you out here. Go <laughs> have a nice day. It's there's global warming here in Los Angeles. It's so hot. I want to thank yeah. you for doing this for your great scholarship. If and when you come to LA, I'd love to meet you. And when I get yeah, out, absolutely. You know, we, we can do a hang if you'd like. And if you ever want to learn to surf, I'm your guy. I do. I do want to learn to surf. It's a very Rooseveltian endeavor. Oh, I'm sure. Yes. You know, it's very TR-ish, you know, um, and uh, I'd be happy. I got extra boards. That's my thing. I didn't surf yesterday because I had to finish Allegiance before I finished. Before I said, no, I'm just going to crack it. I'm going to crack this book. I'm going to finish it. I'm not surfing. But fortunately, the waves were small, so it worked out. So anyway. All right. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll do it. Kermit, thank you so much, folks. Special thanks to Kermit Roosevelt, the third or the fourth, depending on how you're counting. Till next time, namaste, shalom, and aloha. By that, I mean namashaloha. Thank you, Kermit, and everybody for listening. See ya. Take care. Okay. Okay. Boom.